Well, I, I just uh, saw a news feed come over. The economy in Wisconsin must really be kicking in because they're projecting the state's going to collect an, another $4.4 billion in tax revenue between now and 2023, above what they projected. Wow. All right, everybody, we're live on YouTube now, about one minute out from the launch. All right, Tim, 30 seconds. And go ahead, Tim. Well, good morning. I'm Tim Sheehy, president of the Metropolitan Milwaukee Association of Commerce, and welcome to the business of Metro Milwaukee. This monthly webinar puts a spotlight on the challenges and opportunities we face in sustaining and growing the region's prosperity. We hope these insights will help you shape your business and inspire you to help shape the region's future. And we're gonna start this morning with an inspiring story of Milwaukee Tool, will be joined in the front half of the hour by Steve Richmond, group president for Milwaukee Tool. We'll get his insights on developing innovative culture and how it drives growth. Milwaukee Tool's recent plans to again expand in the region, highlight the attractive assets we have to support the growth of jobs and capital investment. Following our discussion with Steve, we will be joined again by Dr. John Raymond, president of the Medical College of Wisconsin, for his perspective, looking ahead as Wisconsin vaccinations reach 43% of Wisconsin residents, offices welcome back employees, and summer travel kicks into gear. But first, a word from our program's sponsor, United Healthcare. United Healthcare is partnered with MMAC to make it easier for employers with 5 to 99 employees to find a health plan that works for your employees and for your bottom line. When you work with an MMAC affiliated broker, you'll receive discounted rates on United Healthcare's All Savers Health Plans. Plus, you have the option to add other United Healthcare plans to your employee benefit package, such as specialty plans and supplemental fi financial protection plans. So find out what's up with over 300 companies and their 11,000 covered lives and why they joined this program by contacting your MMAC broker or visit MMAC.org to learn more. And finally, the deadline to apply for MMAC's Focus on the Future Awards is this Friday, June 11th. These awards will recognize inspiring stories from Milwaukee region's business community in five categories, talent, growth, livability, equity, and innovation. Small businesses, startups, nonprofits, and diverse businesses are especially encouraged to apply. So visit MMAC.org for additional information and to fill out an application. So Steve, let's uh, turn to you. And again, thank you very much in your busy schedule for joining us. Um, and I thought a good place to start uh, is just to have you give us a little snapshot of Milwaukee Tool, um, what you make, who your core customers are, and what your footprint looks like today. Well, thanks for having us. Uh, excited to be here today. 
you know, we've uh, made a big transition. Uh, 15 years ago, we were $450 million. Uh, we are an electric tool company. Uh, we were not relevant to users. Uh, we clearly could not recruit, retain, and invest in the best, the best people. Uh, and we were not the kind of company uh, we are today. Fast forward, uh, you know, we're really a company that's driven around our culture. And we really created a culture many years ago that was the foundation of who we are and the two bookends of our success, our culture and people. Uh, that sets the foundation for the today and for the, for the future, uh, clearly. And I can talk about culture all day long because it's so important and is the ingredient for Milwaukee Tool. In terms of who we are today, uh, we finished last year for uh, 5 billion globally. We hit our goal, which was 5 billion in 2020. Uh, we've grown uh, for the past 12 years, over 20% per year. Uh, we are a, a company that is not a tool company. We don't view ourselves as a tool company. Uh, you know, we kind of use the, the parallel between uh, Blockbuster and Netflix. And if you think about that Blockbuster situation at the height of their stock, their CEO said, we're a brick and mortar retailer delivering tapes and candy and food. And then this small little company came up called Netflix. And as they first started delivering CDs, they said, we're an entertainment company. And that's who we are. So our mantra is we are a solution provider towards our co core trades, driving productivity and safety on the job. We are throughout the world in any society, in any market where people care about productivity and safety on the job or parts of those markets uh, where they participate in, in those arenas. That has allowed us uh, to go from that electric tool company to the, the leader in, in cordless technology in the world. And, and, and that cordless technology is in, in power tools. It's in vacuum cleaners uh, on the job site. It's in lighting on the job site. It's in new, pneumatics on the job site. It has transitioned from gas to, to uh, cordless power tools or cordless equipment today. Uh, in addition to that, we participate in power tool accessories, uh, which is extremely important to us in offering all of the accessories to fit the, the tools and drive productivity on the job. Uh, from a, a hand tool safety and storage perspective, uh, you know, we are a hand tool player that provides the, the hand tools to, to recognize what that user needs. Safety equipment, uh, including N95 masks that we'll be soon producing along with our new hand tool factory in, in West Bend, a complete startup uh, that we're extremely excited about. And then pack out our modular storage system that provides uh, solutions. And new categories such so like outdoor power equipment, not only for those pro users who will buy our product today, but eventually uh, as we see the transition from gas into cordless in this area, we believe we have an opportunity to become the largest uh, manufacturer and solution provider in outdoor power equipment, both handheld uh, as well as riding equipment uh, far into the future. So we're a very, very different company than what we were. Our core users started with mechanical, electrical, and plumbing end users, kind of our foundation in post-World War II, and has gone from there to really uh, remodeling end users, residential end users who are electrical, plumbing, mechanical, uh, uh, commercial end users in those same array, as well as HVAC end users, general contra uh, contractors, uh, utility workers who are, are clearly part of our uh, core, carpenters who are part of our core. Anywhere where we can drive productivity and safety on the job is who we are as a company and as a business and as a solution provider. Great. And if you're listening today, you can certainly, if you've got a question, I'll try to work it in the conversation with Steve. Uh, you can drop it in the Q&A box and we'll try to pick it up from there. Um, Steve, the only analogy I could think in, in kind of asking this question was um, what, you, the, growth of, the growth of the company has been so explosive. What are the keys to driving the rocket ship? I mean, how do you continue to grow this fast and keep what you call the key, the key fuel in place, the culture? Yeah, there's no question. It's a challenge. Uh, our, our two bookends are culture and people. And what do we do to recruit, retain, and invest in, in, the, in the best people? That's a key part of it. Uh, no question about that. Uh, what do we have to do to be able to accomplish that objective? Uh, number one, recruit. 
uh, you know, we, we have to make sure we, we are recruiting the best and the brightest, brightest either from other companies uh, or clearly uh, from out of universities uh, throughout the United States. And we clearly want to be able to take people out of Madison and Marquette and MSOE and Platteville and other uh, places locally. But we're heavily recruiting Carnegie Mellon and MIT and uh, Illinois and Purdue and multiple other universities throughout the U.S. to be able to bring that kind of talent in. And we need to give them an opportunity to be able to prove themselves and grow and, and, and change the game in a, in a significant, significant way. Retain, uh, we have to understand who the people are and what they want. And everybody's different, right? You know, we have people that have gone through recessions that have joined our company and they, they want job security. They, they want a growth company. Uh, they want to feel like they're contributing in a significant way. We have people that want to give back uh, to the community and we're advocates of giving back as, as you're well aware, you know, uh, Milwaukee Academy of Science is a key piece. Hunger Task Force is another key piece. Uh, various uh, schools uh, throughout the area Habitat's a key piece in terms of giving back. So those people that want that, we want to be able to do uh, drive that. Continuing education, uh, we believe that's essential. And that's something we do internally for training and development. Uh, and we believe based on past COVID that we're now going to be able to take the best and the brightest professors in technology like AI and help them train our entire organization that want to be involved in that and take that to the next step. So all of those are elements. Saying that, uh, this past 15 months has been the most difficult time from a COVID standpoint. Uh, you know, we're usually a group that gets people together, celebrates our success, face-to-face uh, -face dialogue. Candid is the word that we use all the time to be able to drive the best uh, performance from all of our team players. And having that kind of relationship uh, without being face-to-face -face every single day has been difficult. And now with things opening up, we believe that we can get back to that Milwaukee culture uh, as, as well. So all those are some of the ingredients to be able to make it happen. But candid dialogue, the viewpoint of uh, never settle, always improving, empowering our people, uh, are critical. What also keeps the rocket ship going, as you said, is uh, what we call X to I. Uh, 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 Cotter wrote a book called Accelerate, and in his book Accelerate, he, he talked about how do you get groups of people to think about new opportunities, uh, empower them, understand that failing's okay, invest in it, spend more capital, more investment, more on technology. And we've done that as we've gone into new products, new categories, new businesses from our sales, our marketing, our service, all different aspects of the business, which have really driven it in, in, a, in a, a real significant way along that way. And we all believe in disruptive innovation. Clayton Christensen's model of the innovator's dilemma, we believe that's why we continue to change the game and every field towards our users and allow our people to really grow and explore and, and change the game on a consistent basis. Yeah, Steve, Steve you joined the company in, in 2007. So um, you have a relatively um, fresh perspective on, on Metro Milwaukee. What are the strengths, uh, if, if we use the analogy of Milwaukee Tool being the rocket ship, what are the strengths and weaknesses of Milwaukee as kind of a launch pad for that? in recruiting and retaining talent in, 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 in what you see. So, so what would you say are our strengths and what constructive criticism would you give to us? You know, the, the, the great news is uh, if, if I go back 13 years ago, 14 years ago, when we brought uh, either people that were in the workforce or new people out of college and brought it in Milwaukee, it was difficult for to get them excited about the city. Uh, now we bring them to the city and we let them explore the city. We let them, uh, you know, see what the Bucks have done and the change that that has, has occurred to the city. We uh, let them go to the third war. Uh, we let them go to Brady Street. We let them see the restaurants and the environment and the amount of youth uh, that is in the city today. And that has become an extremely strong positive. Cost of living, cost of living for youth coming in from different markets and, and people that are relocating. Uh, even with the costs increasing today based uh, post COVID are still very, very affordable compared to other cities uh, across the board. And all those are extreme positives. Challenges, 
uh, you know, the, the challenges during COVID were more extreme because of the cold weather and not been able to get out and not been able to join with other people along the way. Uh, but our, our biggest challenge is uh, attracting more and more people to understand the benefits of Milwaukee from, from the lake, the benefits of Milwaukee uh, that are here and recruiting the number of people from a technology viewpoint that we need to really be successful. Uh, I'll, I'll be real frank, the lack of uh, driving technology in Milwaukee, even with the starting points that, that are happening right now, is not allowing us to be able to recruit the amount of electrical engineers and software developers that we need as we are a technology company today. Every one of our products includes uh, sensors uh, or MOSFETs. And if we don't have that along with our lithium batteries that we can't drive where we need to go uh, at, to the fullest. So driving technology and the ownership of technology and the understanding how important that it is uh, to, to Milwaukee and to Wisconsin from our university level uh, that MSOE gets and Marquette's starting to get and, and Madison is there, but not at the, at, at the top, uh, really needs, needs to improve for us to be able to get the kind of talent that we need at, at, at Milwaukee Tool. Steve, and, and I know there's been some misinformation out there with the expansion downtown. You're not leaving Brookfield. You're not leaving Menominee Falls. You're not moving your headquarters. You're expanding your footprint in, footprint in the region. So talk a little bit about why downtown was an important complement to what you already have going. Yeah, you know, to your uh, point, and, and Tim, as you've been not only supportive, but helping us drive what we need to be able to satisfy the growth needs of Milwaukee Tool and and uh, yourself and the MMAC and everybody that works for you is, has done an unbelievable job in assisting us along this, this journey that we've been on for the, for the, the past 15 years. Uh, you know, if you look at Brookfield, we, we expanded our Brookfield campus from 207 people when I joined, uh, you know, and we used less than the 200,000 square foot that I was there. We added another 400,000 square feet, another 150,000 square feet of office and R&D and development space. We put up a whole building dedicated to power tool accessories. Uh, and from a headquarters, a global R&D center, that it, it, Brookfield has been the focal point. And then the, the new office buildings that, that we uh, built as, as well in the local area. Uh, would be absolutely a requirement. So then why do we go downtown? Uh, number one, we're out of space. We are completely out of space. We have 650 job openings right now at Milwaukee Tool uh, that we're, tr we're trying to fill. And consequently, our perspective was that if we want to recruit, retain, and invest in the best talent, if we want electrical engineers and software engineers and young people uh, coming in, one of the key ways for us to be able to get there was going to be uh, to be able to have a downtown office space to take advantage of uh, what is going on downtown and the renaissance downtown between the various areas uh, where uh, youth as well as other individuals want to come in and provides an opportunity for us to recruit a more diverse talent than, than ever before. And that's a significant opportunity and we're clearly excited about that. And I'll tell you, our teams are extremely excited about the opportunity about uh, adding downtown on top of that. Yeah, I think one of the things that uh, uh, we, ha we have under recognized with Milwaukee Tool, Steve, is you're recruiting people in here from all over the country. And I think I was telling you the story the other day, one of you, your new recruits is bringing a trailing spouse who we hired. Um, and so one of the things here is, as, as you're bringing in this talent, you, there's also other talent coming with it that other companies can benefit from. Absolutely. No, no question about it. And when we're bringing people in from uh, all over the Midwest and some people from the, uh, from the Northeast and, and out West as well. Uh, and then uh, university grads that are coming from, like I said, it, it's not just the Wisconsin schools. It's the schools throughout the Midwest, some from the Northeast, uh, along the way, and, and we're excited about those those opportunities as well. And it's all about talent for us. If you, there's no way, unless we have the best people, can we align that with, with the culture that we that we need to be able to to continue to grow. 
couple of questions from the viewers, Steve. One is, uh, your growth is amazing. I know a strong 50% of your business comes from Home Depot. What are your plans to continue the explosive growth in the other 50% of your business? Yeah, let me say it this way. On a global basis, less than 50% of our business is Home Depot. Uh, and, and uh, you know, Home Depot is a great strategic partner. We have a lot of great strategic partners uh, like Do It Best, who is actually in our headquarters today. Uh, other players like Granger and Fastenal and, and Colony Hardware and Ram Tool. And you can go on and on about Ferguson Supply and, and all of those others. Uh, what we say is there are certain players that we have not partnered with. You know, we walked away from Amazon.com. We walked away from True Value. We walked away from uh, Lowe's and Menards. We didn't believe they were great strategic partners like the other uh, players that we have today. And it's our perspective that we need to focus on users, deliver what they need to drive productivity and safety on the job, and align with partners uh, that will allow us to continue to continue to grow and flourish, not only in the US, not only in Canada, down in Mexico, down in various parts of Latin America, in Australia, where our business continues to ex explode. In Japan, that we're entering for the first time, actually uh, this year, uh, EMEA with our, our European business is, has absolutely exploded, not last year, but over the past 10 years. And we, we are doubling down and investing there. So we are a global footprint from Milwaukee uh, overall. And, and that's critical to our long-term future and success. Um, another question about the MX fuel line. Um, did, you, did it have competition or did you invent the market space? And what are some of the highlights of the market discovery and development process? Yes, uh, MX Fuel was, uh, you know, one of those X to I's, Excel to Invest, where we said that we can either, either wait or we're going to have to leap. And our, and our viewpoint here was that we were going to lead the revolution to drive technology to be able to say we're going to turn gas equipment into cordless equipment on, on side of the job site. Uh, and the response has been overwhelming. Uh, and, and we're investing more and more in, in the platform every single day. Uh, great examples, you know, some of the shocking examples is uh, we have a cordless cutoff saw uh, that you would see as gas powered only in the past. Well, uh, it, it, what has happened is uh, throughout the world, uh, we have firemen and uh, uh, workers uh, that are out there. Uh, and that are doing rescue applications. And it turns out that they view this product as the best of the best. It doesn't matter if it's in Taiwan, J Japan, Korea, uh, Germany, the UK, uh, South Carolina, or, or Wisconsin. It, it, and it's really created some excitement around the product on top of the job site opportunities for each, each of the, uh, the category as well. Fantastic. So talk about this because you referenced a little bit, Steve. What, what are the what's the biggest positive and the biggest ne negative uh, on your business uh, from COVID, from that experience? Uh, big biggest positive is our understanding on how we're going to be able to leverage technology to communicate and train and develop very very differently. So we're working on a pilot right now uh, where we have uh, Jeremy Ebner and, and Melissa Caldwell heading up one from our engineering team and another one from our training and development and, and leadership uh, uh, team. And they're working on a pilot to say, okay, how can we get the, the best professors, uh, the best teachers, the best educators on AI uh, in the world and get them to be able to train the people in our engineering development, marketing, uh, all those different areas and do it, do it through a team's environment where we'll create a, a six and a 12 and a 24 month curriculum along the way. So areas where we always said we want to change the game from an educational standpoint for our people, we're now going to be able to do that. And we would have never got there this quickly if it wasn't for COVID. So that was, that was clearly the big positive. Uh, the biggest negative is, uh, you know, how do you celebrate success? And we've tried, we've tried, we were trying to do it all kinds of aspects of doing it. And you can finally see it today inside the building where people are coming together uh, and we're 
uh, actually next week's the first uh, food trucks that we're going back to uh, deliver at Milwaukee Tool, which, uh, you know, this time of the year was an institution for us on a consistent basis. So being able to celebrate success was, was actually getting people together and getting people to have that kind of a dialogue in that way was uh, not what we usually want it to be. The second piece was our outside in philosophy. Our viewpoint was one of the reasons we were able to win is that we're different than our competitors and we're different than the rest of the industry. And that's that we believe that if we were on the job site, understood what those pain points were, understood from our concept people, our engineering, our marketing people, and they understood and they could see visually what those pain points were, that we could create radical disruptive solutions for that. And getting on those sites during COVID has been extremely difficult and extremely challenging. And now with that opening up, we're able to take that to the next level again. You know, one of the advantages of having Milwaukee Tool here is you have a substantial vendor and supply chain spend in the region. But the other part that's been very impactful for Milwaukee, Steve, and I want to know your thoughts on how, how you see this returning and when it will return is, you, you brought in thousands of guests, customers uh, to fill hotel rooms and come here and see that. When do you see that returning? And, and do you see that returning to the same degree that it was? Well, yeah, uh, today was the first customer we've had since COVID. Wow. Uh, uh, so we're actually, the teams are ecstatic over it. Uh, you know, and they stayed downtown. We went to, uh, you know, our favorite restaurant, as you well aware. <laughs> yes. uh, and Omar was actually opened it up for us uh, to have a, a, a dinner at Carnivore with, with the group. And we, we did that last night to be able to uh, make that happen. Uh, and so we're starting to see it now. And we believe that week by week, month by month, uh, we're going to see that really open up in a big way. And by October, it, it will be uh, back to, to normal times for that standpoint, we believe. Great. Steve, one of the things that uh, I've been impressed about, because uh, you're running a global co company with a global uh, uh, brand and you're in and out of Milwaukee, it, is your personal commitment to give back to the community. Not only, you know, kind of sitting on the MMAC board, but you've really gotten involved in the Milwaukee Academy of Science. So I want you to talk a little bit about why that's important, why it's important to you, and how that is part of um, one of the drivers of the company's culture. Yeah, I, I will say uh, say it this way. Uh, some people are very passionate about giving back. And some people that we recruit had brought up the viewpoint of uh, Milwaukee tool giving back. Uh, and we have been giving back for many years in our Greenwood manufacturing facility where we've done uh, assisting kids to get educated, uh, single head of household and giving them scholarships along the way and other approaches in each one of our facilities. Uh, and I, I had the wrong mindset back then, uh, pre COVID. I had the mindset uh, that even that if we did habitat, even if we did hunger task for it's not our opportunity to be able to broadcast what we're doing either to internally or externally at all. Uh, then COVID hits and, uh, we started to get a lot of feedback that people that were joining the company were saying, well, you know, we joined, but we want to give back. We want to be part of something to be able to give back to various diverse communities and to the Milwaukee community itself. And we realized we needed to step back and change our philosophy. And, and it wasn't that we were forcing giving back uh, on, on to individuals inside the company, but we needed to make it absolutely clear that that was part of our culture. Uh, and part of who we were as a business. Uh, for uh, me personally, uh, you know, it, it's been uh, one of, uh, I'm extremely fortunate, you know, uh, and I look at that every single day, uh, extremely fortunate. And, and when you see what uh, somebody like Anthony McHenry has done at MAS, it, which is taken uh, a group of kids where you have other schools in, in the environment that are at a 20 or 30% graduation rate and he's driving a 95% graduation rate. And you hear the stories of those kids and those individuals. 
And you take that and you take Habitat and you take Hunger Task Force and you take the other giving back, the veterans commitment that we've made in Racine and that we're trying to do throughout Milwaukee as well. Uh, and you see that as a Milwaukee tool, our people can help the people and help society and help the Milwaukee community continue to advance and, and grow and let the people that really feel strongly about that, that are passionate about it, that are joining our company, work together and because it is working together to be able to give back then it's something special and uh you know we're fortunate we have the ability to be able to do it and it's clearly becoming a more living part of our culture uh, culture not only from the past but clearly into the future uh, throughout all of our facilities uh, uh globally so knowing there are no guarantees in life except for maybe a milwaukee tool that keeps its charge uh, as you look forward five years, Steve, what, what do you see for Milwaukee Tool and what do you see that kind of impact uh, to, to the Metro Milwaukee area? Yeah, you know, from, from Milwaukee, uh, we are a growth company. Uh, our, our objectives is pretty clear, 20% growth per year. And we believe that growth provides opportunity, opportunity for our people to continue to grow and flourish. Uh, opportunity for uh, our people co to continue to advance their careers. Uh, all of that in a significant, uh, significant way. And uh, what does that mean to the community? Well, uh, quite frankly, like when we come downtown uh, and start in that facility, what's that gonna mean? It's gonna mean that people are gonna go out to lunch. They're gonna stay there for dinner. They're going to relocate in, in some of those locations, just like we do out in Brookfield or out in, uh, out in our other facilities or in West Bend or in our other manufacturing facilities as well. And all of that comes together is that we believe that we will help the city, the communities and the people uh, in a signif significant way. Fantastic. Steve, the half hour goes fast. Uh, I wanna honor your time uh, and just ask you kind of a wrap up question here. Um, any, any message that you want to deliver to Milwaukee before we uh, move on to Dr. Raymond? Uh, you know, uh, number one, thank you. Uh, thank MMAC and, and your leadership in terms of what you guys have driven to be able to assist us in this journey of growth along the way. Uh, you know, if, as Ty, our CFO would say, uh, clearly, uh, there is no way we could have made all of this happen without your support and your help and, and other key people throughout uh, the, the community that have allowed us to be able to do that. Uh, lastly, uh, our ability to be able to have the best talent in Wisconsin and in Milwaukee is absolutely essential uh, for the, the future of, of Milwaukee and how we accomplish that together, uh, especially on the technical and the innovation side is absolutely critical uh, to our success today and, and for the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the road. Well, thanks, Steve. Great to have you. I, I had uh, no idea on that uh, windy, cold day in the tent outside your facility in 2011, uh, how hot it would get. So uh, appreciate uh, being along for the ride. And again, thanks for your time. Thanks for the leadership. We appreciate it. Thanks okay. for everything. All right. Take care. Thanks, Steve. Dr. Raymond. Thanks, Tim. Uh, it's an honor to be here this morning. And thanks, Steve, for a very inspirational presentation. Um, I'd like to just run quickly through mostly good news, um, which is which is great to hear. Um, we'll start with our numbers. And thank you. Um, and I think the, most of you who've been following the story of COVID-19 and the pandemic here in Wisconsin will recognize immediately how good these numbers are compared to just a few months ago. So only 66 new confirmed cases in Wisconsin yesterday with a seven day average that's trending favorably. Um, and it was 133 yesterday. Positivity rate by person also continues to trend favorably now down to 7.9% in Wisconsin and a reproductive number that's as low as it's been since the beginning of the pandemic at 0.66, which is an early indicator of continuing favorable trajectory and a collapse in many ways of the spread of COVID-19 in our state. Similar trends in Milwaukee down in the bottom, 18 confirmed new cases, and our seven-day average also trending favorably at 20 per day. 
um, positivity rate down to 5.3%, also trending favorably, and an R of 0.66. And to put these numbers into perspective, you can see total cases in Milwaukee and in Wisconsin and our previous highs on the right-hand side of the slide. So very, very good news. The next slide, please. And continuing with the theme of good news, uh, only one death in Wisconsin, and that was in our region yesterday, with declining seven-day averages of three in Wisconsin and less than one at 0 0.4 in Milwaukee. Hospitalizations also are down to new lows of 170 in Wisconsin, continuing to trend favorably, and 67 in the HERC-7 Milwaukee region. ICU censuses also are very favorable and trending um, in a good direction with only 60 in intensive care units in Wisconsin and 31 here in southeastern Wisconsin. And again, just compare those numbers to our peak numbers on the right-hand side of the slide. Um, so really excellent progress. Next slide, please. This slide shows in pictures um, how our counties are doing compared to earlier in the pandemic. So on the left-hand side of the slide, you can see that all the counties in, in uh, Wisconsin were either at critically high in red or very high levels of new case burdens back in the middle of November. Fast forward to the middle, which would be early March, and you can see a declining case burden with most of the counties having a high or medium case burden. And then to the last available data from last week showing that half of our counties have a medium case load and the other half have a high case load, uh, which is great. It shows continuing progress, but it also tells us we still have a ways to go uh, before we can feel comfortable that incidental contact out in the community would have a minimum risk of transmission, but we are moving in the right direction. Next slide, please. And this is all largely due to our success in vaccination. So if you look at the left-hand side of the slide, we're at 48.5% of Wisconsinites who have been vaccinated with at least one dose. Uh, actually, if you look at the New York Times website, it would suggest we're over 50%. 43% are fully vaccinated according to DHS. Milwaukee is catching up with the rest of the state. 46.4% of individuals in our region have been had at least one dose with a nearly a 40% full vaccination rate. Um, so this really is continuing good progress. On the other hand, we have clearly slowed down in terms of our ability to get shots in arms over the last month. And that reflects a national trend. And actually, if you look at some of the leading international uh, countries, it's a trend that is uh, really manifested everywhere. So next slide, please. So just some numbers. Uh, worldwide, more than 2.1 billion doses of vaccine, COVID-19 vaccines have been administered. And the US is first in the world for total vaccinations at 299 million as of yesterday. I'm sure we're over 300 million today. Um, China claims to have about the same number, but the numbers aren't validated. And we have a very high percentage of individuals who've completed the series at 42% in the US compared to most of the rest of the world. We're lagging behind some smaller countries, Israel, which I think it's important to follow because they were first to get over 50% but they have slowed down very significantly in their progress now at 57%. Bahrain, 50%, Aruba, 49%, Malta and Mongolia, 47%, uh, Curaçao at 45%, and Chile at 44%. Peers at about 41% are the UK and Hungary. And I do think that it's important that we look at two countries to see how we may do going forward. First is Israel, which continues to have a very low burden of disease, low hospitalization, and low severe symptomatic disease. And this is with some penetration of some of the variants of concern. UK, on the other hand, which has a similar vaccination rate to us, is seeing surges, especially in younger populations, and fairly significant illness in younger populations they are having um, two variants of concern that are predominating. The first and most important is what we call the alpha strain or the UK variant, which has been predominant in the UK for many months. 
but also perhaps more troubling is penetration of one of the so-called Indian variants, which seems to be much more contagious even than the UK strain, which up to this point uh, was the predominant strain in any country in which it uh, was, was uh, pr a present. Um, we are still in Wisconsin, uh, in one of the top 15 US states and territories in terms of the percentage of our population that are fully vaccinated, but we are clearly dealing now with vaccine confidence as a potential limiting factor in continuing success. If I can go to the next slide, please, Chris. This slide uh, shows some key takeaways. We have made significant progress against COVID-19 in the US. Our seven day average of new cases now is down to almost a little bit less than 14,000 with a 45% decrease over the last two weeks. Hospitalizations also are down to um, very low levels at 23,000 uh, with a 22% decrease over the last two weeks. And daily deaths also are declining significantly at 437 as a seven day average yesterday, down 22% over the last two weeks. In the US, 42% of the population is fully vaccinated, and that equates to 50% of eligible individuals 12 and older. We've given at least 171 million people one dose, and 140 million have been fully vaccinated. But vaccinations are declining, but we're inching forward, and every shot in an arm gets us closer to our new normal. And the vaccine supply clearly exceeds demand, and I'm pleased to say, and I'm, I'm sure that you know, the U.S. It has agreed to ship uh, some of our excess doses to countries in need. And I'm aware of promises that were made to Taiwan and India, for example. Uh, but we are projected to fall short of our uh, 70 to 80 percent, quote unquote, herd immunity target. Uh, but we might make it to the 70 percent of eligible individual target by July 4th that President Biden outlined, but it's gonna be close. Um, daily vaccinations in the US have declined. We're now at 1.13 million per day, which is down 67% from the peak of 3.38 million per day on uh, April 4th or 13th. Some hopeful news, uh, under 12 might be eligible by autumn. Both Pfizer and Moderna are moving ahead with studies of, uh, of infants through 12 years old. Uh, they already have dosing regimens that seem to make sense and they're starting to put shots in arms. Also US vaccines, the three that are on the market, Moderna, Pfizer and Johnson & Johnson appear to be effective against current variants, including the Delta or India variant, the B1.617.2 variant that is now surging in India, although that does also appear to be um, declining somewhat there. We can go to the next slide, please. Just a couple things. I do wanna make sure that people are aware of the new World Health Organization uh, nomenclature for variants. They don't wanna stigmatize countries. Um, so we're gonna to have to get used to different reporting. And this may be actually easier for the media and for the general public to understand. Um, the four variants of concern that are recognized by the um, World Health Organization and by our CDC are shown in purple, and they're the first four there. So the alpha is the B1.17 UK variant that was first reported in September in 2020 in Southern UK, and that's the one that is predominant in most countries of the world. Um, it is probably um, or has been the most contagious variant and also comes with an increased lethality. The beta variant or the B1351 was detected first in South Africa in May of 2020. And this one does have some escape from vaccine immunity. In particular, there are some concerns that the Johnson and Johnson and the AstraZeneca vaccines may have reduced uh, immunogenicity, although the protection still is pretty good. Um, the gamma variant is the P1 variant that was first spotted in Brazil. Um, this is of significant concern in South Africa for reinfection of people that were previously infected with wild type COVID-19 and perhaps a higher level of um, disease burden in terms of severity. And then the Delta is one of the two Indian variants, the B 
1.617.2. Um, this is one of particular concern. And again, I said, let's see what happens in the UK. Even though 41% of the population is fully vaccinated there, um, young individuals are getting sick with this Delta variant. It appears to be significantly more contagious even than the Alpha or the UK variant has been. And so this bears um, some caution on our part uh, because there are cases that have been reported in the US. And if it is as contagious and as um, severe as it appears to be in the UK, we just need to be mindful of that. And then these other variants that have been reported are variants of interest, uh, the ones in blue, but have not actually been demonstrated to have increased contagiousness, lethality, or escape from immunity, either from a previous infection or from the vaccines available in the market. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Tim. Uh, the next slide simply shows our data sources for the presentations. Uh, thanks very much, Dr. Raymond. Uh, a, a couple questions. Um, if you look out ahead to the fall and we think about people returning to school, people returning to work, um, more indoor events, where would you like to see Wisconsin by the fall to give you kind of the continued confidence that we can move ahead? Well, I'd like to see us at, at least 70% of eligible individuals vaccinated. Um, and that would include the 12 to 18 year olds, which um, were a little bit slow getting vaccinated, I think. Uh, we need them and we, we, need the, um, we need to be able to vaccinate kids under 12. Um, and so that'll come sometime very likely in the fall. I believe that there'll be an expedite, expedited either um, authorization or approval process, depending on the data. Um, I also believe just in terms of addressing vaccine confidence, that it is very likely in July that the FDA will move from emergency use authorization to full approval of the uh, Moderna and Pfizer vaccines for at least the 18 and older and perhaps the 12 and older populations. And I think that's gonna eliminate some of the conceptual barriers that employers might have about mandating vaccination. So that'll help get us closer to that 70, maybe 75% of eligible individuals being vaccinated. A um, couple questions from the audience here. Uh, because we're vaccinating and things are getting better, do you anticipate that those who are not yet vaccinated will need additional carrots or sticks to keep the populace healthy? And uh, what, what will that be important to continue to show gains or will they just naturally be safe because of a lower risk uh, of contracting the virus and less spread? Well, let me just say we're in speculative territory here. Yeah. Um, I never agreed with the CDC's rationale for easing some of the uh, masking uh, recommendations. Uh, let me just say, I, I wasn't opposed to relaxing them, but the idea that somehow this would serve as a reward, which I think anybody that's watched congressional testimony has seen Senator Rand Paul talk about, we need to reward people and removing masks would be one. I actually thought that it would incentivize people who hadn't been vaccinated to believe the pandemic is over and that they didn't need to get vaccinated. Um, and so we're, we're still in, in territory. We, we don't know which, which way people are going. Um, but I, I think the idea of extra incentives um, to get that extra 10 or 15 or 20% of people that haven't been vaccinated yet vaccinated um, makes sense. We're probably gonna need to do that. Um, does, having, uh, does having previously had the virus make getting a vaccination less important? Uh, do you have proven natural immunity if you survived uh, contracting the virus the first time? And what's the case for vaccinating those folks? Okay, yeah. Um, so first of all, yes, we, uh, we have seen pretty robust immunity for people uh, who've been previously infected with COVID-19. But the wild card here is the emergence of these variants of concern. And we know that at least for the P1 variant, uh, that's the one from Brazil, um, that um, having a previous infection doesn't give you very much protection. Um, we also know from other, other vaccines that you get a broader, deeper, and more robust immune response to vaccines than you do to a previous infection. And I think, again, that's important for these variants of concern. Um, and we also know that people get a boost in their immune response 
if even if they had a previous infection, if they get vaccinated. So I uh, strongly advise that whether you've had COVID-19 in the past or not, that you get vaccinated. And that's consistent with the DHS guidelines and recommendations here in Wisconsin and with the CDC recommendations. Another question, how are younger people in the UK getting sick from the Delta variant? Well, they haven't been vaccinated. Um, the UK, like the US, had rolling eligibility for either based on age or pre-existing comorbidities that would predispose to bad outcomes from COVID-19. And so 41% of the population has been vaccinated. The 59% of the population that hasn't been are largely young people. Um, and young people are less likely to restrict their social interactions, to um, practice mitigation measures. Um, and, you know, there, there is, uh, and it's true, that early in the pandemic, young people were less likely to get severe disease. And so all those factors would lead to an enhanced susceptibility to COVID-19, which is looking for their most susceptible host. Vaccinated people now aren't the most susceptible host. Young people are either by biology or by nature of their behavior. And we're gonna see the same thing here. So it's really, really important that with the expanded eligibility for um, 12 and up that we get, we get our kids vaccinated. If your herd immunity can't be achieved at 70 to 80%, what does that mean for the long-term impact? Will the vaccine be adopted as part of the required vaccinations for attending school or participating in sports like other vaccinations were for prior generations? I think yes, but there will be pretty significant political battles over that. Um, this should not be a political issue. We require vaccinations uh, for other diseases, uh, but this has become heavily politicized. We may need bo annual boosters, uh, as, especially if the case burden in the world is high, that gives the, the virus many more replication events or opportunities to mutate and turn itself into something that's more contagious and, and uh, causes more severe disease. So we're gonna, we're gonna need to monitor that. So you may question the premise here, but I'm gonna ask the question. If children under 12 aren't considered spreaders and aren't exhibiting symptoms as adults, um, how, how do we understand the need to get them vaccinated? Yeah, thank, thank you, Tim. The, the premise is oversimplified. Children under 12 can get and spread COVID-19. They're just less likely to do that than adolescents and older. Um, so the risk isn't zero. Um, what we're also seeing is that um, children and young adults now uh, under 18 are 25% um, of the cases that are being reported in the US and that they're more likely to be hospitalized now than they were earlier in the pandemic, probably because of these variants of concern are taking root again, the UK and probably soon the Indian variants are gonna be um, more likely to infect kids and probably to make them sicker. And um, we're, we're also seeing that it isn't just this multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children that's relatively rare, but can be lethal. Um, that's a concern for us, but long hauler symptoms in kids are becoming uh, more obvious now that there's a higher case burden in kids. So again, let's, let's not just assume that kids can't spread it or they can't have a serious case of COVID-19 with the potential for death, I mean, they can. Here's another question with an assumption in it. Uh, with all the evidence that suggests that masks have virtually no impact on changing the trajectory of the virus, why does the wearing a mask continue to be an issue even worthy of discussion given the unnecessary controversy this causes? I disagree with that premise entirely. Um, and I wrote a review article that looked at the literature, the pros and cons of wearing masks. Um, in the Wisconsin Medical Journal uh, last November, and I would recommend that anybody that wants an objective look at the totality of the data, not cherry picking one or two studies that confirm our bias, um, would look there. Masks do play a role. It's common sense. It's supported by lots of different types of science. Yeah, I mean, Dr. Raymond, have you ever seen an issue like this um, where um, people don't seem to turn to the medical expert for the answer. Um, and I'm going to show my bias. They listen to a strain on talk radio or something and come up with an answer. I mean, I used the analogy a while with you to, a while ago with you that, um, you know, there's a reason I don't file my taxes. Uh, I have somebody else do it because they're an expert in it. 
Um, and so this continues to be a part of the challenge. And one of the reasons I respect you coming on is I think you give us a very unemotional, factual response to questions that come up in everybody's daily lives and uh, we pick up a thread and then uh, run with it. Yeah, Tim, and, and look, it, it is confusing. There, there's a lot of poorly curated information out there um, that's readily available to everybody. There are medical experts who don't believe in masks. Um, so, you know, let's just say that there is not unanimity from science and medicine. And there is, to me, a mystifying um, lack of trust for um, science, for public health officials, that has really made it difficult for us to, to bring the well-curated, thoughtful, uh, critical thinking forward for, for people to feel confident about interventions, simple interventions like masking and, and social distancing. So, so we're back to the question on children under 12. Um, the question is because I've seen that 25% statistic, um, but to that 25%, if less people in general are getting the virus, doesn't that skew the 25%, i.e. are they, are, there are 25% of the cases because the number of cases has significantly dropped, not because the cases of children getting it are increasing. Is it's that- both. Yeah, T Tim, it's both. So, okay. you know, certainly um, when you have fewer people in nursing homes or over 65, that are getting sick. It's, it's simple math that even if you have a steady state of kids that are getting sick, that, that they're gonna have be a higher percentage, but there are more kids getting sick and they are getting sicker than earlier in the pandemic. And this is a, a trend that's been emerging over the last three to four months. As older people have been vaccinated, it's just become much more apparent. Yeah. Um, and, and then a, a, another question uh, as again, I saw the this morning that I think Southwest to announce they're only now 7% below uh, their pre-COVID travel. And so clearly that's picking up. We hear Europe is opening up this summer. Um, and so as travel starts to pick back up, uh, what, what are your thoughts there? And again, in terms of just the concerns uh, of reigniting what we've spent a lot of time tamping down? Well, let me just say, I don't think that we're going to reignite a huge surge in the U.S. unless one of these variants of concern has more immune escape than, than we think it does. Um, but, you know, to stop wearing masks, we need the world to get the, the pandemic under control, especially if we're traveling, traveling internationally. And that's going to take a few years. And again, every infection that happens somewhere else in the world is an opportunity for the shape-shifting virus to reinvent itself and perhaps pose a future threat to us. So it just means we need um, not, not to live in fear, but to maintain vigilance and, and surveillance and to reach out with our resources and our talent and expertise to try to make this a worldwide effort. Um, well, thank you very much uh, again, Dr. Raymond, for uh, joining the program. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to answer the very good questions we're getting in. Um, and uh, hopefully, again, uh, putting good information out will help us all make better decisions as, as we move forward. So, again, very much appreciate your time doing this. And thank you all for joining us in the questions. And we'll cede back an extra four minutes to everybody for their day.